Well, today is the 4th of July. It's a day where we celebrate the signing of the Declaration of Independence when the original 13 colonies made the bold statement that they were separating from the formidable British Empire. What ensued was a years-long war that the American revolutionaries fought to gain the freedom that we so enjoy today. Because of their sacrifice, today we enjoy many great freedoms. One of such is the gift of the freedom of speech. If we have an opinion about anything, we're open to say it. Even if we're completely unsatisfied with the way our government works or what's going on, we have the freedom to express our thoughts. Not every country has that luxury. Ronald Reagan used to tell a story of an American and a Russian talking about their respective countries. The American said, look, I can walk into the Oval Office, pound the president's desk and say, Mr. President, I don't like the way you're running this country. And the Russian said, I can do that. The American said, you can? He said, yes, I can go into the Kremlin, walk into the general secretary's office, pound on his desk and say, Mr. General Secretary, I don't like the way the President of the United States is running his country. A lot of people have gotten a kick out of that joke. Even more than that, the revolutionaries fought for other freedoms as well. They fought for us to have the right to bear arms. Now that's a controversial statement today, but it's true, and they did do it for a purpose. We also have another, one of the greatest rights of all, freedom of religion. As Americans, we're able to gather here today freely, without any fear of some government police force to rush in, take us, capture us, take us away for practicing our faith. There are millions in the world today who are going through persecution and great amounts of pain because of their Christian faith, and we really should pray for them daily. However, as amazing as these freedoms are, as incredible as sacrifices those men and women made, none of it, none of it, compares to the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross to free us from our sins. I'm thankful for what the Founding Fathers did to create this country. I'm thankful for the freedoms we have today, but I'm even more thankful that it doesn't matter who's in charge in the White House. It doesn't matter who has power in Congress. It doesn't matter what law gets passed. I know who's sitting on the throne of heaven today. He's an unchanging God, he's a loving God, and he loves you more than you could possibly ever imagine. God loved us so much that he sent his only son to die on an old rugged cross so that we might gain the freedom from sin that we just don't deserve. He left all the glories of heaven, the golden streets, the magnificent mansions, the absolute perfection so he could come down to this earth and make that sacrifice for you and for me. And yet there are so many in this world today, and there might be even some in this service this morning, who have not accepted Jesus as your personal savior. So if you will, if you've brought your Bibles today, turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter eight. It's John chapter eight, and we'll be reading verse 31 down to verse 36. John chapter 8, verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? And Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. And if the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. The first thought I want to explore this morning is in that 31st verse. It says, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. This little verse distinguishes that there are more than just two groups of people in this world, Christians and non-Christians, but in fact there are three, Christians, counterfeit Christians, and non-Christians. You see, to truly be a Christian, you must follow what the Bible says. This is so much more than just saying, I believe in Jesus, I know he's the Son of God. After all, this verse says that many believed on him. 
But what truly matters is one's follow through. It's so easy to say with your words that you love God, but does your life truly reflect that you do? He walked into a fancy restaurant with his family. They seated them, and after a few moments at their booth, they brought them their drinks. They had ordered an appetizer, and they were working their way through the menu, trying to decide exactly what they wanted. The waitress returned and asked them what they wanted to order. The gentleman always wanted to be last, so he had everyone else go before him. You see, he wanted to see what everyone else would choose on the menu. After seeing what everyone else chose, and after mulling over all the options, he finally made a selection and realized that there were a couple sides that came with his meal. So the waitress asked him what kind of potato he would like. Would you like french fries, a baked potato, mashed potatoes? The man sat back a little bit and thought to himself and said to the waitress, you know, I love mashed potatoes, but are they real? <laughs> are they real? He's trying to say in a polite way, he doesn't want any of that fake stuff. You know, the kind of mashed potato science experiment that comes in a box. You add a little water, maybe a little milk, some butter, and it all comes out with the appearance of mashed potatoes, and that's about where it ends. Now, some of you might be looking at me and saying I'm a mashed potato snob. Maybe I am. I don't know. But the waitress uh, responded to him when he asked if it was real. She said, I'm not allowed to tell you. Now, that's all I would need to hear right there. I'm getting the baked potato. But the man persisted a little bit and said, if we were best friends, would you tell me? The waitress thought for a moment and she said, well, I'll tell you this. I've worked at this restaurant for four years. I've been in the back of the kitchen many, many times. And throughout my entire tenure here, I've never seen a potato peeling on the floor. He got the baked potato. <laughs> you see, as Christians, our goal in life is to be as Christ-like as we possibly can be. After all, it's in the name. But when we're newly saved, when we're babes in Christ, we still have a lot of rough edges that God needs to mold. It's when we're saved, it's only the beginning of a lifetime of God peeling away the undesirable parts of our life so that we can be in the exact mold that God wants us to be. It's often a painful process. Have you ever peeled a potato? You take a knife and you shave the skin away. Sometimes there are those little bumps on them, so you've got to take a knife and carve those out. You take out any bruises or any part of the potato that you deem unfit for yourself. Well, it's like that in our spiritual journey as well. Many times, God is carving into our lives to cut out what he needs to cut out. We go through painful experiences, maybe the loss of a loved one. Perhaps your spouse, a close friend, heaven forbid, a child dies. The devil tempts you to want to scream and become bitter to God for letting for taking away the one person that meant the most to you in this whole world. But Jesus whispers in your ear and says, I'm here for you. Trust in me, abide in me, and I'll carry you through this time of darkness. And so, you learn to derive your comfort from God, making peelings on the floor of your life. You lose your job. You've worked at this company for years. You worked hard and your loyalty to the company was second to none, and yet they lay you off for budgetary reasons. You have a family to feed, you have bills to pay, and the devil tempts you to be angry at God for letting you go through such an unstable time financially. But Jesus whispers in your ear and asks you to depend on him. He will provide, and so you depend on God, and you watch as he miraculously guides you and your family through such a difficult time, making peelings on the floor. Your spouse gets cancer, or your child is born with an incurable disease, and the devil tempts you to abandon God because clearly he's abandoned you. At least that's what the devil wants you to think. But Jesus whispers and says, trust in me. Lean on me for strength. And so, you learn to lean on God for strength making peelings on the floor. Folks, are there peelings on the floor of your life this morning? Is there evidence of Jesus touching your life? 
Have you made an effort to continue in the word, as John says here in this verse? Or when people look at the way you live, do they see an empty floor? You haven't changed at all. And in fact, you've said no to God's working in your life a couple times. Maybe so many times that you don't even feel God's talking in your life at all. You've come back under the bondage of the same sins that held you before. If that's you today, listen to these next words that Jesus says. Verse 32, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I, I'm assuming here that everyone here wants to be free. I would suspect that if you heard that some other country had landed on one of our shores and declared war on America, that some of you would probably have a problem with that. Some of you have taken that right to bear arms to heart. And if someone knocked on your doorstep with the intention to enslave you, you would have what I would like to call an explosive response. In America, we despise the notion of being ruled under someone's thumb. We can't stand the thought of being enslaved. And yet so many today have become quite comfortable being enslaved to sin. This is what Jesus was tackling with the Jews of his day. The response to the offer to be set free was that they had never been in bondage to anyone. Yet they didn't understand that the sin that they had in their lives was actually holding them in bondage. How true that really is. I think it's interesting when I've met people who are addicted to drugs, alcohol, pornography, or whatever else, that they remark that they would never want to be a Christian lest they be bound to all the rules that Christianity requires. Since I've been in college, I uh, got a job at a hospital there in Cincinnati. I've seen addicts shake uncontrollably while suffering from withdrawal. I've heard stories of broken families because one uh, spouse didn't want to give a single inch to their ex, and now they only get to see their children on the weekends. I've seen patients emphatically tell nurses that they'll never quit smoking because it's one of the only true joys they have in their life. I've literally heard those words. And yet, I look at the Christian. No, they're not going out and doing every sin that their heart desires. You won't see them frequent certain businesses because of their values. You won't hear them say certain words because God says you shouldn't. You won't see them engage in certain activities because it's immoral. And yet, let's say if you were to get out of your car this morning and walk into that church and ask any saint what they thought of being a Christian, I guarantee you that they would emphatically say that there is no better way to live. They feel more satisfied and more fulfilled than they ever did before they were saved. So you ask me who's more free, the person who does whatever they want, but is a slave to their addictions and as a result have brokenness in their life, or the person who's accepted Jesus as their savior and feels the satisfaction of knowing that at the end of the day, they can pillow their head at night knowing that they're right with God. I'll take the Christian's freedom any day. God has a habit of setting people from their sins. All throughout the Bible, you see time and time again, God setting people free from their sins. Jesus, while, sitting, while hanging on the cross, set the thief next to him free from his sins. He had spent his whole life stealing and taking advantage of people, so much so that he was condemned to execution. But that sin wasn't too big for God. Paul, on the Damascus Road, met God in a blinding light and was ultimately set free from his sins. He had persecuted the church and had murdered an untold amount of people. He was even at the site of the very first Christian martyr, but that sin wasn't too big for God. I think in the Old Testament of the story of Rahab the harlot. As a prostitute in the city of Jericho, I guarantee you everyone knew who she was. Everyone knew the kind of li life that she lived. No doubt her reputation preceded her, and when she went into the markets or the town square, people most likely talked about her behind her back. Yet because she was sensitive to God, she and her whole household were saved from the destruction of Jericho and God set her free from her sins. She even ended up marrying an Israelite, giving birth to a man named Boaz, a direct descendant of Jesus' adoptive father, Joseph. Because God sent her free from her sins, because she stayed open to God, she ended up being in the direct line of Jesus himself. 
Listen, I don't care what you've done. Jesus can set you free from the bondage of sin. If he can set free a thief, if he can set free a murderer, a prostitute, and many more, he can set you free from your sin as well. I've heard too many stories of people feeling like they can't be forgiven of their sin. They leave the altar without the victory. They say they've done too much, that they've gone too far. Let me tell you this morning, you can't fall down a hole so deep that God can't pull you out of it. That's the kind of truth that will set you free. The last thought I want to explore is in the last two verses. It says, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. This is a grave reminder of the truth behind this message. The word servant here reminds us that in any household, there's a difference between the servant and the son. You see, the son is a permanent dweller in the household, but the servant can be ejected at any time. In effect, Jesus is saying to us, if you have unrepented sin in your life, if you're a servant to sin, then you can't be a part of my family. You can't enter my house. You see, if you're in the state of being a servant to sin, you have absolutely no inheritance to the kingdom of God. You're not a part of his family. And if you were to die in that state, you get no access to heaven whatsoever. If you die in that state, you're going straight to hell. And I bet you anything that the people burning in the white flames of hell right now aren't thinking to themselves, boy, I'm glad I wasn't bound to all those rules of being a Christian. No, they have the greatest regret of all, knowing that for the rest of eternity, the rest of eternity, they will be in agonizing pain, paying for the sin that they were a slave to for so long. I'm also concerned for the ones who claim Christianity but aren't truly right with God, the counterfeit Christians that we talked about. There are a lot of people in this world who would say that they're a Christian, but their life doesn't show it. They don't have any peelings on the floor like we talked about earlier. This was the same problem that the Jews had that Jesus was talking to. They thought that because they were Jews, they were sons in God's house, and that nothing therefore could take them away and banish them from God. My goodness, how many people think about that with their own faith today. They think that because they claim Christianity that they're now sons in God's house and that nothing therefore could ever banish them from God. But be careful. By your conduct, you are making yourself a slave and a slave can be ejected from a master's presence anytime. So I implore you to make sure that you're doing everything that God's asked you to do. First John says this, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Folks, are you set free? Are you free from the bondage of sin? Have you accepted the truth that Christ came down to this earth, lived among man, died on the cross, and on the third day rose again to set you free from your sin? I can tell you, there's absolutely no better way to live. And for those who claim to be a Christian today, I want you to make sure. Does your life show evidence that Jesus has touched your life? Or have you settled for business as usual? I'll tell you, that won't fly with God. He demands our whole life. He wants every part of you. And if you surrender that to him, he will bless you and fulfill you more than you ever thought possible. On this 4th of July Sunday, Independence Day, a day where Americans all over the nation celebrate freedom, make that all-important decision to be free from your sins.